today we are going to get back in the saddle, so to speak, uh, and uh, return to uh, Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah. We're in a really interesting place uh, here. Uh, we are now in chapter 9, the last, uh, the last section of uh, Zechariah the prophet. So for a number of weeks, we uh, were looking at the visions uh, that Zechariah had, visions of encouragement that God had not abandoned his people and continued to build the temple. That's where we read about, you know, the, if you're familiar with uh, the, uh, the never, uh, uh, the, the, the candles uh, that last forever, you know, uh, in the, um, the, the menorah or the candelabra in the temple uh, where uh, Zechariah had this vision of the presence of God always uh, symbolized by uh, the oil that never, uh, you know, that uh, never ran out, right? Uh, and then, of course, you have that famous phrase in the fourth chapter, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, and and, uh, and, a, and a group of visions uh, that really ministered to the people in that day. They were very much uh, like, you might say, like sermons, you know, like encouragements, uh, uh, exhortations uh, to keep going. Very similar to um, his counterpart, uh, Haggai, the, the prophet. Kind of a similar type of message. But now when we come to the ninth chapter, uh, the, the tenor changes. Uh, chapters 9 through 14 uh, uh, speak about the future. Uh, and uh, they're mostly poetic, uh, and uh, they're designed also to encourage and motivate the people, but they're focused on the consummation. They're focused on the coming of the Messiah. They're focused on the Messianic age and, and how uh, God... Uh, Will, will be victorious over Israel's enemies once and for all. Uh, and frankly, uh, for the people in Zechariah's day, it was kind of like the way we read uh, the, these uh, uh, texts, where we read about the future, we read about the, uh, you, you know, when, when Yeshua appears again, and we read about how uh, all the nations will be uh, judged or, and or turned to, to the Lord, and that motivates us. Uh, you know, in the Brit Chadashah, Peter talks about the living hope uh, that we have because of the victory of Messiah Yeshua over the, over, uh, over the powers of death and evil and, and so on. And so it, it motivates us. If you remember, uh, you know, it's one of my favorite passages there in 1 Peter chapter 1, where he says, even though it might not look that way right now, <laughs> you know, I, I, I recognize that there is an inheritance uh, awaiting for you that cannot be destroyed. Nothing can, nothing can take it away. So keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Uh, and that's kind of what Zechariah is uh, doing here. Now, some of these passages can be difficult to understand because difficult to interpret. I'm not gonna, they're not so hard to understand but to interpret exactly, because sometimes we're not sure, are they speaking about, about uh, a, um, the immediate future? Are they speaking about a long time from now? Does it go back and forth? Uh, how, how, does that, you know, how does that work? Well, we're going to answer that question, hopefully, uh, here. So these are oracles of judgment and of the coming of the Messiah. One way or another, we end up in the same place, regardless of how we may interpret it. It's about judgments at the end and the coming of the Messiah. Uh, in fact, I, I'll just say right here that, that uh, Zechari passages in, from Zechariah chapter 9 through 14 are sprinkled all throughout the Brit Chadashah, all throughout the, the New Covenant Scriptures. Uh, which tells us, and as we'll see in a little while, these must have been known texts, the, the, especially this end part of, of Zechariah, must have been known uh, texts. 
And there were, uh, you, know, uh, you know, they didn't have books, right? They didn't have regular books that they had on a bookshelf. But they did have something called testimonia, which were like scrolls of messianic promises and, and prophecies that, that teachers would use and that were read at, at different times. Uh, a passage like Isaiah chapter 49 that talks, uh, you know, uh, about the lion from the tribe of Judah. And as we'll see, most likely a passage here in Zechariah chapter 9, a very famous passage um, that is quoted in all four Gospels. Uh, it's, it's that important. Uh, and so oracles of judgment and the coming of the Messiah. Encouragement that there's a glorious future, right? Don't we all need encouragement that there's a glorious future, uh, right? Because it certainly doesn't look that way. In fact, it looks like there's no future, right? Uh, but there is indeed a glorious future, and we are not purveyors of positiv positivism uh, or of optimism or even of pessimism. We are purveyors of hope, right? The hope that doesn't change, that never changes. Uh, and uh, we need to recognize that in times like this, it's like some of the greatest opportunities— of, of, uh, of sharing what really is good news. Uh, and so let us not get sucked into, you know, the negative attitudes that everybody has these days, right? Uh, and what's interesting is these chapters uh, are identified with Yeshua in the New Covenant Scriptures. And I will say, in, in rabbinic sources all over the place, these chapters are identified with the coming of a Messiah. That, uh, um, uh, and it's really very interesting uh, here in chapter 9 and in chapter 12 and in chapter 14. It's not only it, uh, that um, uh, in the New Covenant Scriptures, but also in Jewish sources. It's, you know, the, these passages are well, are well known about the coming of the uh, Messiah. So certainly, boy, how important uh, they are uh, for, uh, for us. Okay, so we want to take a look here in chapter 9. That's where we're at. Uh, that's where we are uh, today in, uh, in chapter 9. Okay, so if we uh, open up our scriptures or tap on our scriptures... <laughs> Okay, uh, and uh, look in uh, Zechariah chapter 9. The first thing we read here, it says, The burden of the word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach with Damascus as its resting place. For the eyes of men, especially all of the tribes of Israel, are uh, toward uh, the Lord. Uh, and so, you know, what that means is this is a burden of the word of the Lord. And so looking, uh, to, uh, looking to God as we see these different uh, locations. So first, um, I, we see in uh, verses 1 to 8, a judgment on cities located along the coast of the Mediterranean. Right? If you go from north to south, uh, some of these are cities today. Uh, that uh, still exist as cities today. Some of them are in Israel. Some of them are, uh, are not. But that's not really the point. Uh, the point is these are uh, judgments on, on uh, an area uh, of the land that historically uh, has been uh, uh, in the hands of, uh, in the beginning, Philistines and later on the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans and, uh, you, you know, and so it represents here in Zechariah's day, uh, you, you know, uh, um, threats, threats to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the land. Uh, and then uh, in verses 9 and 10, the victorious King Messiah who comes as a man of peace and humility, Right? Uh, and then in verses 11 to 17, a description of the victory, a description uh, of the victory. So it's a very important chapter uh, for us. So 
But it begins with this uh, phrase or this word, the burden of the Lord. The Hebrew word is masa, and it can mean, you know, uh, it can mean oracle. I, I, but it, the word contains a sense of like compulsion. Like uh, the prophet has to say this, that it's like a heavy weight on the prophet, and he has to say this. We, you read it often used as a proclamation of judgment. Uh, you see it here. You see it also in the 12th chapter of Zechariah. You also see it in a very interesting uh, set of chapters in, Ze in Isaiah, in chapter 13 of, of Zechariah. You know, I, I like to call the chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, and 18 in particular, uh, like the lost chapters of Isaiah. Why do I call them the lost chapters of Isaiah? They weren't lost. You're not going to see a thing on uh, the History Channel on the lost chapters of Isaiah. Okay, stop. Okay. Uh, uh, what it is, they're the chapters that hardly anybody pays attention to. They're the chapters that talk about judgments on varieties of lands and so on, but they do contain very interesting statements, and we might look at one or two of them, but you do read this burden, this, you know, the burden. Uh, and then we, you know, we might ask ourselves, why, uh, why is this called a burden? Why is it under compulsion that the prophet must say it? Uh, you, if you really study this word, the idea is kind of like he has, to, he might not want to say it, but he has to say it. He's compelled to say it. And these are often judgments on nations. Now, we might think, oh, good, vindication. Oh, good, like retribution. Oh, good, judgment on people. Yeah! You know? Uh, you know, it always reminds me of the, the beginning of uh, the prophet Amos. We talked about this uh, a month or two ago, that at the beginning of Amos, you know, he talks about for three transgressions and for four on on Tyre, on Sidon, on Damascus, these same places, you know. Uh, and, and you can just, you get the idea that he's talking to Israel, right? And there's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the next thing you know, it says, for three transgressions or for four on, on Judah. Whoa, hold on, right? Uh, or Israel, whoa, hold on. Uh, and so the point I, I would suggest to us, for us here today, is that just as you read in the Brit Hadashah scriptures, uh, you know, God desires that nobody perishes, right? God desires that the nations would turn to the Lord, right? And may I suggest that in this week's Torah portion, when Moses, for the second time, I kind of has this argument with God, don't destroy the people. What will the Egyptians think? You know, what will other peoples uh, uh, think of you if, if you do this? That, in other words, the point is, is that the testimony of, you know, uh, God desires that the nations would know his great miracles, that the nations would know all about the deliverances that God provides, Right? Very similar to our own personal journey story or our own testimony, right? That God desires that we share that story with others, that they might experience the same kind of deliverance. Uh, and that is what good news uh, is. So when we think about Rahab, isn't that amazing? Uh, what does she say to the spies? She says, I heard about what happened. I heard about what happened uh, you know, when, uh, when your people came out of Egypt, uh, that's Israel's testimony. If they had all died in the wilderness, she would not, it would not have ended well, uh, and there would not have been uh, that kind of testimony. She is an example of the fact that God did not desire that all the Canaanites would just die because they're Canaanites. But it was because of their, their sin and their communal sins uh, but God desires uh, that people uh, are redeemed. Isn't that the whole purpose, ultimately, of the coming of a Messiah? Is uh, the redemption of the world, right? Uh, and, and so 
I, it's kind of interesting that the word burden here is used. Uh, it's kind of like a sad, heavy word when he's talking about the judgment of nations. It's not like, uh, oh, glory to God, they're all going to get their heads chopped off. You know, that's usually our feeling. Uh, but we'll get to that. Okay. All right. So you see judgment on cities along the coast, historically, Philistine cities and enemies of Israel. So let's read uh, uh, some of this here. Uh, you read, uh, well, in the first verse, we read about Hadrach with Damascus as its resting place. Nobody knows exactly where Hadrach was uh, or even uh, Hamath, but uh, evidently uh, in um, uh, Aramea or Syria. Okay, north of, of, uh, of Israel. And then you have uh, Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise. That's kind of an interesting statement. T these were a very uh, wealthy, historic, powerful cities. Okay? You know, if you go to Israel, you kind of look at them, all of them as like rubble, you know, or excavations, uh, you know. Or small towns. Or, or, but in the ancient world, these were significant uh, uh, places. Uh, and it is kind of interesting when you read about, about here, uh, Tyre and Sidon. They are, they, those locations would be in modern-day Lebanon. They, they would be in Lebanon uh, uh, today. But notice it says, though they are very wise. Doesn't it just kind of remind you of like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you know, about the wisdom of the world, that God is not impressed. And that even though they, are, they were very wise, even though they were powerful and also very wealthy, they were not more powerful nor, nor more wealthy uh, than God. Uh, and, uh, and very important, uh, certainly in our world, uh, to remember that as well. Uh, people that are wise in their own estimation or are wise according to the world uh, does not mean, uh, at the end of the day, uh, victory or uh, success. For Tyre built herself a fortress and piled up silver like dust and gold like the, the mire of the streets. Uh, behold, the Lord will dispossess her and cast her wealth into the sea, and she will be consumed with, with fire." Right? Uh, and so even though it may look like there is power all over the place uh, and nations and city-states to be feared, not so when we place our trust in God. Ashkelon will see it and be afraid. Gaza, too, will writhe in great pain. Ekron, for her expectation, has been confounded. Moreover, the king will perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon will not be inhabited. Uh, and a, a, a mixture of peoples will dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. These were mostly Philistine cities. That's why uh, he's talking about them. He's not referring to, you know, some of today, some of them are in Israel, some of them are not, right? So that, that's not what's relevant here. What's relevant is the power of God uh, uh, over uh, uh, nations, empires, and cities uh, that seem to be um, uh, beyond, uh, beyond uh, uh, touch, right? Uh, and so uh, we see here that uh, uh, certainly God uh, is uh, uh, the one who is powerful, no matter what it may look like. Now, and kind of interesting... Uh, it says here, I will remove their blood from their mouth and their detestable things from between their teeth. Then they also will be a remnant for our God and be like a clan in Judah and Ekron like a Jebusite. Remember, the, uh, Jebus was the, uh, where Jerusalem was, right? Uh, now, th that's very interesting because verses 7 and 8 are sort of a little bit of a transition. You know, you read here about, it seems like, uh, a remnant from these places, 
I, I will be like the clan of Judah, a remnant for our God. Okay? And then he says in verse 8, But I will camp around my house because of an army, because of him who passes by and returns. And no oppressor will pass over them anymore. Uh, for now I have seen with my eyes. Uh, and so you, you see here that this judgment will also uh, have some deliverance uh, involved uh, with it. Uh, and, and so it's very interesting how they are, in a sense, setting the stage for verse 9. Okay? Now, there's two ways to understand this judgment, according to most people. Uh, it is interesting that Alexander the Great, who is mentioned uh, uh, tacitly in the scriptures in a couple of different places, uh, did conquer these places uh, in the 300s, which was with, you know, uh, not in the same day as Zechariah, but in the not too distant future from Zechariah that Alexander the Great uh, uh, conquered these cities, but not Jerusalem. He did not, you know, uh, conquer Jerusalem the, the way that he uh, conquered the, these uh, other cities. And that is rather interesting. So the people that hold that view would, would say uh, this, uh, that you see in the providence of God, God uh, uses, uh, uh, you know, uh, people like Cyrus, you know, and, and others, uh, leaders of empires, uh, sometimes to do his, his bidding. And so that's rather interesting, right? Uh, others would view this as uh, an end-time judgment, that it, it has nothing to do with anything historically from the time Zechariah wrote it all the way to the time of the end, right? Why does there always have to be two choices, right? I, I would suggest here, a third way, right? That the historical events prophesied that, that point to the distant future. In other words, in, in other words uh, you see uh, events taking place all throughout history uh, that seem similar to or kind of like what's going to culminate uh, at the end. Uh, some might say that Okay, well, you know, Alexander uh, did these things, but he did not exhaust everything that it says in the passage. Uh, and uh, that um, there's always these, it's always pointing to the future, pointing to the future. What's interesting is that, again, in Isaiah chapter 13 and 19, you see similar, ju similar judgments on the same places spoken of hundreds of years earlier, Right? Uh, and so now it's hundreds of years later, and those cities are still there, <laughs> right? Uh, and and Zechariah carries it, uh, indeed, uh, uh, carries it uh, uh, forward. Many of these kinds of passages use, uh, use places in their day, right, uh, to uh, talk about, yes, what God uh, uh, will do, Throughout history, just like when in Daniel, when we talk about the, the four kingdoms, there's way more than four world empires, right? But those four world empires represent empire, represent empires of man. Uh, and so one could say, perhaps, that the destruction of these cities uh, by the Greeks, uh, you know, re repre uh, represented the judgment of these cities throughout history, because the Greeks were also judged. <laughs> and that's, you know, important uh, also uh, to understand. But quite clearly, as we will see, this whole passage in the 2,000 years ago was understood as ultimately referring to the judgment when the Messiah comes. Okay? Uh, no matter how you get there, whether you get there by... These uh, represent world events that have taken place or, or you know, or I uh, look right to the, the days of the Messiah. They were meant to encourage the people uh, that, that ultimately God is the victor, okay? 
very, very important. And that should, they should encourage us uh, that way, uh, indeed, uh, as well. And so, what did this mean in Zechariah's day? God is more powerful than powerful nations. Wow, should I say that again? Right? God is more powerful than powerful nations. Do not trust in powerful nations, even if we live in one. Right? Uh, how important it is that our, our, our trust, our hope, our eggs are not in the basket of, of any nation, state, power, uh, or politician. Uh, uh, and very important that we, that we understand that. Now, a good question can be asked. Okay, but th what does that mean? Uh, uh, okay, that's where my hope is. Does that mean I just stick my head in the sand? Uh, that's a really good question. We'll hopefully get to that uh, by the end of the, of the message. Right? Okay. Uh, and ultimately, God will bring victory to his people. This was always a problem for uh, Israel. This was always a problem that trusting in nations, trusting in the Egyptians, trusting uh, in the Assyrians, right? Uh, you know, one of my favorite passages, another favorite passage is Isaiah 30 that says, Woe to the rebellious children that execute a plan, but not mine. Right? Uh, and then it, it, it takes Psalm 91. You should read it on your own. That passage then takes Psalm 91. But, it, but rather than talking about God being uh, the refuge and the shelter, you have Egyptian cities uh, are, are written there. In other words, that rather than trust me, you are uh, trusting uh, basically yourselves and your own ingenuity uh, and, your, and what you're thinking. That has a lot to do with, by the way, this week's Torah portion uh, in the same way. That, uh, remember, they go into the land and they say, we, were like, uh, we were like grasshoppers in our own sight and theirs. But in our own sight, we were, we were too small. There's no way, you know. Uh, and so uh, Zachariah's point was, do not, do not make that assumption, right? It may seem. Uh, that way. Kind of like what Peter says about the, living, uh, about the living hope. Even though you encounter various trials, it may seem like the, the hope is not uh, a, a real thing. But it really is, no matter what it looks like. And so in our world, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it looks like here, no matter what it looks like in Europe, what it, no matter what it looks like in Israel, whatever, whatever it looks like in, in, throughout the Middle East, let us remember that ultimately God will be victorious. Uh, and that is where our hope is. We have a particular role to play between now and then. And we'll see uh, what that is uh, in just a moment. Okay? Uh, and so may we be encouraged uh, in, in such a, a passage uh, as this. When you think about uh, not so much... Uh, Tyre and Sidon and, you know, and, and those places. But there's, a, you know, North Korea and Russia and China and uh, all the politics there. And then there's uh, the corruption everywhere and the craziness here. And, uh, you, you know, um, I, it's, if, you if you just look hor uh, historically, there's a good reason to be depressed. I mean, there is. You know, you got to be crazy to be optimistic. I mean, we should all be really pessimistic and be watching from rooftops for people, you know? Uh, unless we have real hope or we're just living in denial or we just watch old westerns on TV and don't know what's going on in the world. Oh, anyway, okay. All right, so... I mentioned here verses 7 and 8 already sets the stage. A remnant from the nations and a remnant from Israel. That's what verse 7 and 8 is. It really is interesting. Let me see. Can I tell you? Yeah, why not? And, uh, you know, if you take a look, keep your finger there in Zechariah and go to Isaiah in those, uh, as Rodney Dangerfield would say, those chapters that get no respect. Okay? 
uh, in Isaiah, first of all, in chapter 13, see where it says uh, the oracle concerning Babylon? Same word, you know, Masa. And then you're, you're going to read, uh, you know, if you read all through here, not only Babylon, but other nations as, you know, uh, as well. But it is, uh, you know, uh, rather uh, interesting uh, that um, when you come uh, 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 to, uh, let's see, chapter 18, uh, toward the end of chapter 18, uh, you read uh, this in verse uh, uh, 7. At that time, a gift of homage will be brought to the Lord of hosts. At that time, of course, that time is always that in that day, in that time, and, you know, in the, 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 when the Messiah uh, uh, comes and reigns. Uh, at that time, a gift of homage will be brought to the Lord of hosts from a people tall and smooth, even from a people feared far and wide, a powerful and oppressive nation whose land the river divides to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, even Mount Zion. That's rather interesting, uh, and, and, you know, and certainly uh, amazing. I, I, rather than trying to figure out exactly who that is, isn't it interesting? It says, from a people feared far and wide, a powerful and oppressive nation. Wow. So that means that what God desires that, uh, you know, uh, that, that no one would be uh, a lost, Right. Uh, and that there will be a remnant uh, from the nations. There are several other places in here uh, where uh, you can discern a remnant from, a different, uh, from, from different places, as well as uh, this, uh, this judgment. And, of course, uh, the remnant of uh, Israel. But verses 9 and 10, when we come to verses 9 and 10 back in Zechariah, uh, 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 chapter 9. We read uh, these, famous, uh, these famous verses. Okay. Whoops. There we are. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war will be cut off, and he will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Uh, and so here, this is a familiar passage because it is, it is uh, quoted in all four Gospels. When Yeshua rode into Jerusalem, he purposefully, intentionally uh, rode on the colt of a donkey because he knew that these people knew this passage of Scripture. And he was identifying himself as the king of Israel. He knew who he was. He did not become the king at the, at the surmising of Paul later on, right? Uh, or of, uh, you know, um, uh, or only after the resurrection was it decided that, oh, we'll make him into the messianic king. Yeshua knew who he was. And he rode into Jerusalem uh, on this uh, a donkey, the colt of a donkey. Uh, and we want to understand really what that, you know, what that means. And we get that here in this uh, passage, right? So first, we read that this is something really good, right? We read the, almost the same phrase in Zephaniah, by the way. Uh, in terms of like a, a great statement of redemption. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. I mean, and behold, your king is coming to you. Unlike world rulers who are full of pride and greed, uh, the Messiah of Israel, the king of Israel, is different, right? 
Uh, and he is just, we'll start there, stop there. He's just, he's righteous. Uh, we read in so many passages uh, of a, a scripture that he is a righteous king. That means that he does the right thing, the right thing, the moral thing, the ethical thing. He does the right thing. Uh, what he does is not based on political gain. What he does is not based on polls. Uh, what he does is not based on his own legacy that he's trying to leave or anything like that at, at all. Uh, he does the right thing. And so uh, I would suggest that, you know, when we think about our world, we'll just say morals and ethics really matter. They're not like second place. As long as the policy's okay, okay, the guy's a bum, or this one's this, or that one's that. Uh, but it's okay because I like the policy. Well, that may be okay, but it's not in the Bible. That's, you know, it's, it's, it does not work, <laughs> okay? It just doesn't work. Uh, and that is why uh, the Messiah is different, and he is our role model, and the role model, hopefully, for all of us, okay? So he is righteous. You read that in passage after passage. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 42, uh, you read it in uh, um, Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. Uh, you read it uh, uh, in, in a dozen other uh, passages, right? He is righteous. So the first thing we learn is what he's like. Isn't that interesting? It's not, the first thing we read is not what he does. And then, by the way, let me tell you what he was like. You know? It's this is what he's like, and then this is what he does. Okay? So we see here, just then endowed with salvation. This is a very interesting uh, phrase, because in Hebrew, it is reflexive. It is. It is not that he's carrying salvation to bring. This is real. Oftentimes, in our English translations, it's looked that way because the, the translators can't quite articulate another way to say it. But it's really that he himself is like delivered. That the king is delivered. The king has experienced some kind of deliverance. So some pretty good translations use he's victorious, like he got through it, uh, you know, uh, and, and experiences victory. But notice I have here Isaiah 53, uh, verses 10 to 12, that describe uh, the Messiah uh, in, in a very interesting way. And it's just uh, trying to be true to the text and understanding uh, what it is uh, saying. So in Isaiah 53, you read here, verses 10 to 12, the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. I would suggest this is what it means that he's endowed with salvation. Uh, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He'll be victorious. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. I will divide the booty with the, 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 booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death. And if this was a different message, we'd go to Philippians. <laughs> but anyway, that's another story. Because he poured out himself to death. He was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors. Yeshua was victorious in that he overcame sin and death. He rose from the dead, and he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And I would suggest that is what it means he's endowed with salvation, that he's victorious. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's a difficult um, phrase in Hebrew, but I think that's what, it, that's what it's getting at. In fact, in Isaiah 50, which is another suffering servant passage, uh, a neighbor there of uh, 
Isaiah 53, uh, we read here that uh, in verse 8, it, this also is like the words of the Messiah and talks about his suffering. But in verse, look what it says in verse 8. He who vindicates me is near. He who, vind who will contend with me. When we get to chapter 12 of Zechariah, we will see they shall recognize him whom they have pierced. Yeshua will be vindicated. Uh, he will be ultimately victorious in the eyes of the people. Uh, he is already uh, victorious, of course, uh, in what he came to, to do. Uh, and so he is the messianic king who came as a humble, afflicted servant uh, to bring peace between man and God, uh, to take away the alienation between man and God, and therefore the alienation between man and man. Right? And that's back now in uh, Zechariah uh, chapter 12. I mean, uh, chapter 9. In verse uh, 9, we see, okay, he is just and endowed with salvation, and then humble. Now, that doesn't mean humble like he's like this wilting, uh, wilting, uh, uh, you know, uh, piece of bread that you dipped in coffee or something like that. I don't know. You, you know? Uh, but actually, it's the same word that we read about, like on Yom Kippur, when it says, humble your souls, afflict your souls. He's afflicted, afflicted. Gosh, you know, that sounds a lot like the other end of Isaiah 53, uh, right? It kind of sounds like the beginning of Isaiah 53. And I would suggest that in this passage, you have encapsulated here Isaiah 53, the end of it and the beginning of it, uh, where we read uh, in uh, verse 3, he, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, uh, smitten of God, and there it is, afflicted. Okay? But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed." All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Uh, and so uh, Yeshua coming into Jerusalem uh, on the donkey, uh, the, the king came to conquer the world, but not in the way everybody thought it was going to happen. And that is the significance of riding on the donkey. Do you know that while the donkey does have a sense of, you know, humility associated with it, that is not the primary meaning of Yeshua riding on the donkey. The primary meaning of Yeshua riding on the donkey is that he came as a purveyor of peace. The horses were military machinery in that day. Horses were, were, were used for military purposes. Coming on a donkey represented Yeshua as coming as the shalom maker, as the man of peace. And isn't it interesting uh, here in Zechariah 9, in verse 10, Right in the middle, it says, he will speak peace to the nations. That is the significance of Yeshua riding into Jerusalem on that donkey. Uh, and he, so we know, I won't take the time to go to all four Gospels and read it. But you know the passage. He rides in and there's a Hosanna! You know, uh, glory to God in the highest. Uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Savior is coming into Jerusalem. And man, he's going to finally, uh, you know, take away uh, our pain and guilt and shame of the Romans. Right? 
Uh, and so, uh, you know, it was a long week. And at the end of the week, it was more like crucify, crucify, right? Because he did not meet their expectations. He did not, even though they knew the passage, he did not meet uh, their uh, expectations. Well, we know that chapter, that verse 10 is not quoted in the Brit Hadashah. And that speaks about the second appearance of a Messiah Yeshua when he returns. And this will be articulated much more in chapter 12 of, of uh, uh, Zechariah. When there will be the remnant of Israel and, and there will be a judgment of nations and, and, uh, and, and clearly uh, the, the king will sit on his throne. But it, is, but it is very important for us that this passage speaks about the appearance of Messiah Yeshua when he came. And that, and that there, uh, and just like Isaiah 53, that we do read about, a, about the king, the messianic king doing like two majorly different kinds of things. And this is really, uh, you know, very, uh, uh, very interesting uh, 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 for us. Let me see here. These are the passages in, uh, in the Gospels. And by the way, the same chapter from our Brit Hadashah reading uh, uh, today, uh, right? But this was a well-known messianic prophecy uh, and certainly helps us to understand that the whole chapter is about uh, the days of the Messiah, right? And helps us to understand uh, their expectations. So Yeshua understood who he was. In his first appearance, he came as the humble servant who is delivered from death to be the victorious king. In his uh, second appearance, he will come as the man coming in the clouds when Israel and the nations finally recognize him. Now, we may know that, but rabbinic scholars have understood this, that there's like two different things here right? Rabbinic scholars have understood these two very different descriptions of the Messiah and have created an understanding about how this could be. How could this be? So one view is there's two messiahs, right? You know, Messiah, son of Joseph, Messiah, son of David, the one who suffers, the one who's going to be king, but two different entities, two different ones. And only the second one is really the Messiah, King, king Messiah. Uh, Messiah, son of Joseph, is, they don't, rabbinic scholars do not believe that he dies for our sins and is raised from the dead or anything like that, uh, other than that he's a, he's a military, uh, he's a, um, he is a military leader uh, who uh, suffers, <laughs> is basically how that's understood, uh, right? Uh, but then uh, there's another one, that uh, uh, only one Messiah is going to come, and it's going to be one or the other depending on the state of the Jewish people. And I'll, I'll just read that right out of a, uh, a, Jewish, a Jewish commentary, okay? I, let's see. The Talmud relates... Oh, wrong spot. Oh, here it is. The Talmud in Sanhedrin 98a notes the difference between the account given here in Zechariah chapter 9, in verse 9, I, I hear, count given here, of the coming of the Messiah and that of Daniel in chapter 7 and verse 13. That's the famous passage that says the Son of Man is going to come, uh, you know, a, a man, uh, come as it were a man in the clouds. Is he going to be given dominion over the whole earth? Right? In Daniel, it is written, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a Son of Man came. Well, Zechariah prophesies here that the Messiah will appear as a humble person, riding on a donkey. The Talmud explains that if Israel is worthy, the Messiah will come on the clouds of heaven. But if Israel is unworthy, the Messiah will come as a humble person. Uh, and, and so Yeshua clears it up, right? He clears it up. One Messiah, several appearances. But you know, there is something, when you think about that, so... Yeshua came as the humble suffering servant, certainly Israel and uh, unworthy, right? And he comes to take sin upon himself. 
The interesting thing is, though, depending on how you think about it and how you read it, that when he returns, they're going to repent. There'll be this objective understanding that he's the Messiah. And then he's king. And so in a way, they're not, they're kind of just, like, missing it, you know? Yeshua really does clear it up. And so uh, let me just say this. We're, we are coming to an end. There is hope here, okay? Uh, and that is that um, I don't like to say the first coming of the Lord and then the second coming of the Lord because that gives the impression that he's gone, right? Okay, you know, we have the Ruach, and we only pay attention to the Holy Spirit today, and, we, and Yeshua is kind of like doing some theological things at the right hand of the Father somewhere, uh, you know, I, um, but the fact is, the Messiah has come, and he is here. He appears in person, in the flesh, two different times in that coming. He is here. He is in our midst via the Ruach HaKodesh. And let us get that right, right? I, that Yeshua is here. He is in our midst. We tend to focus, and it's not a terrible thing, we tend to focus so much on the Ruach, on the Ruach, that we kind of forget about Yeshua. And the role of the Spirit of God is to accentuate the presence of Yeshua uh, in our, in our uh, midst. Uh, and so, again, Yeshua does clear it up. There is only one Messiah uh, who is the suffering servant king, uh, and the one who, uh, the one who defeats the nations, the one uh, who uh, uh, will have dominion. Uh, right now, the world is he is the Messiah, and he has the victory. Unfortunately, most people are in rebellion. The day will come when every knee shall bend and every tongue confess that Yeshua is indeed the Messiah of uh, Israel. So finally, so what? What's our big takeaway besides having an understanding of all this? One is what we said. God is sovereign over the nations. Do not fear. God is in control, even if we don't understand what that means. Okay? Uh, yes, uh, nations do all kinds of things. There's wars and rumors of wars, as there always been. There has always been world empires. There has always been the brink of destruction, there's always been corrupt leadership. There's always been craziness everywhere. Uh, you, you know, uh, most of us tend to think the world started when I was born. Uh, and so everything that's happening takes place, you know, only in my lifetime. Uh, right? Uh, but that uh, certainly is, uh, is uh, not the case. Do not fear. Again, read the Darash about what our ancestors did, how fear led them backwards rather than forwards. Uh, and, uh, and, and so let us uh, uh, not be fearful about this world, but see it as an opportunity to be like Yeshua, to emulate Yeshua as peacemakers and humble servants, and not as arrogant and righteous religious people. Okay? Uh, that, you know... Uh, Yeshua uh, came as uh, one who was a shalom maker, the one who, who came uh, and uh, brought people in. We need to be that. We need to see ourselves as that is our primary role is to be sharing the good news, the good news that there really is an alternative to what this world has to offer and that it is real and that it is accessible, and that there is real acceptance, and there is a real future, and there is a real hope, uh, and it is indeed a, uh, a living hope. May we demonstrate humility. May we be people who demonstrate peace, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, being that kind of person, uh, suffering for the sake of righteousness. Uh, uh, and being uh, Yeshua-like in the way that we carry ourselves uh, and, you know, in our hope and in our words. And then I, I have here at the end, seek unity. You know, 
in Ephesians chapter 4, in verses 1 to 3, unity, unity is a huge thing. Unity is really turning swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. Unity is what Isaiah, the end of Isaiah 19 talks about, about Egypt, Assyria, and Israel. Uh, and so of all people, uh, we need to, as, as Messiah followers, uh, you know, we need to hear uh, this word of, uh, of unity, and the world needs to see it demonstrated. In Ephesians chapter 4, after Paul is done explaining to the Ephesian people that you, you've been brought in, you know, you've been brought in, you're one in Messiah, you have your, of course, distinctions, but you're one in Messiah, right? So then he says this, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you, beg you, right, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. If you, you've been in, in, included, you got to walk in a particular, you got to live a particular way. You can't keep doing the same things you've been doing, right? Uh, walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. With all, notice, humility is the first thing. Gentleness, patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, putting up with people, right? Quit being offended all the time, all right? Uh, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Interesting, preserve the unity. Unity comes with Yeshua. What we do is mess it up. We don't create it. We maintain it, but we don't create it, but we can destroy it, you know? Uh, and so... We need to live that way, not only as um, Beth Messiah congregation, but all, the, you know, in the big scheme of things. I, we, you know, I, I'll just say this. I received a, a phone call this week from somebody in our community asking me about putting out materials, about praying for political candidates and things of that nature. And then I gently said to this person that, you know, the Basically, the, uh, he's a, you know, he's a, a Christian person. The, the church has basically uh, compromised itself to, almost to the place of no return, uh, of uh, becoming so politicized and, and um, becoming part of, our, uh, of the culture that it is, uh, that, that we have no, almost no message anymore, right? So, so he was very kind. He said, well, I guess you probably wouldn't want our materials. Uh, you know, but I oh, certainly do appreciate, you know, prayer for people in power. And I said, yes, absolutely. You know, uh, we are called pray for the king, Peter says. Uh, and we should be praying for leaders. Absolutely, we should be. For repentance. <laughs> that leaders would, would like, uh, follow God's ways. Uh, you, you, you know, and... Uh, and, uh, and in some cases, as uh, Tevia said in Fiddler on the Roof, uh, he, certainly he prays for the czar that he stays far, far away from, uh, from them, right? Uh, I, but, but the point is, is that we need to really demonstrate this kind of humility and patience. You know, I believe that when the world sees what we really are about in the, in the hope and, and in unity, that's what the world desires. We have what the world desires, you, you, you know? But generally speaking, what people out there know is everything that believers talk about that they hate. And that is not, gonna, that is not going to bring people to faith uh, in, uh, in the Lord. Uh, and let us remember that. Let us remember that Yeshua, uh, the people he spoke harshly to were the religious leaders. The people that he kept eating meals with and then being chastised and accused about it was the sinners, right? Those were the people that he was like hanging out with, the outliers, right? Uh, not to condone their actions and this and that, uh, but that they might embrace uh, him and be delivered, right? Uh, and so may we emulate Yeshua in that way. As I told 
the people in, uh, in Ukraine, I said, here, they're, they're a country at war. I said, you have a strategic role to play in your country. It's not by, you know, a, you know the, the strategy to defeat the Russians. Uh, it is being leaders, spiritual leaders of places of refuge for people. That is, a, you talk about strategy and importance, that's it. That's what I told them. And that's what I say to us as well. We have a strategic role to play in our world today. Let us take this passage and run with it and, and uh, you know, and really make a difference in our world.